Today I'm going to be going over the management and treatment of anesthetic hypotension. It's unfortunately something that you see all the time running anesthesia and actually um, we're going to go over through the PowerPoint but it does pertain to pretty much every department no matter what um, you're in, no matter what you're doing within the animal hospital. Blood pressure is a measurement that can be obtained in awake patients but it proves to be of utmost importance when you're dealing with any anesthetics. So understanding even the basics of blood pressure and hypotension can lead to an increased patient care and ultimately it's proven to increase your survival rate. Kind of going through these, um, I want to kind of get everybody just overview everything to where you feel good because in practicing correct techniques to obtain blood pressure, um, early detection and treatment of hypotension can be really um, a treatment within the uphill battle that is between hypotension and anesthetics. So just kind of going over everything, who here works in a specialty hospital now? Who is in general practice? All right, do we have any mixed animal, large animal? So um, within these things, who runs anesthesia? Okay, does anyone deal with the super angry cat that wants to eat your face off so you pre it with something? Okay, everyone feels pretty confident that you've had to sedate something at one point um, and within that you're using anesthetics. You're going to use some sort of drug that's going to have some sort of reaction on the body which ultimately can lead to hypotension. Um, no matter if you're running surgery, which is the main thing that we're going to be talking about today, but this information is useful because it's all something that can happen as soon as you give that pre-med essentially. So the basics, um, so your systolic is going to be your blood pressure produced by the left ventricle contraction as it propels blood through the systemic arteries. So that's the contraction phase. Um, your diastolic is going to be the pressure left in the arteries during rest, so it's between contractions. The MAP is the most important when we're measuring or monitoring um, an anesthetized patient. It's really the average pressure throughout the cardiac cycle. Normals, um, we go through these, so the systolic is 90 through 140, diastolic um, is 50 to 80, and the mean that we're really looking for, especially under anesthesia, is 60 to 100. Um, obviously, cats are always a little bit special, so they're going to be different with everything. So how often are we measuring blood pressure? So it's going to be different. I'm going to go over the three different ways. If you're using oscillometric or Doppler, you really want to be obtaining a measurement every three to five minutes. So you want to give those arteries time to rest in between. You can't sit there and pump on everything just like waiting for it to give you different results every time or you need to let everything reset before you're giving it. So three to five minutes is really a good time frame to get an accurate reading. So the types that you're going to have oscillometric, you're going to have Doppler, and then what we use here um, pretty often in our cases under anesthesia is an arterial line or a direct line. So oscillometric, what is it? It is an automatic, less invasive technique used to obtain blood pressure, which uses the auto-inflation of the blood pressure cuff to measure the magnitude of oscillations caused by the blood pressure as it flows through the vessels. Basically, it's an estimated blood pressure that you get through pumping the cuff. The upside to this, it's automatic, it's quick, it's less labor intensive, you don't really have to think about it because it's doing it for you. You can literally set the screen every three to five minutes to give you a reading and it's going to do it. You don't really have to mess with it. Um, the downside, sometimes it gives you off readings. If you have a really teeny tiny patient, it's not going to do much for you. Um, and you can have, depending on cuff size and everything of the, the size of the patient. Um, if it doesn't fit properly, you're going to get skewed readings. Doppler. So the Doppler is a, it uses a crystal transducer placed over the artery to detect flow um, based off of the motion of the arterial wall. So it gives you the systolic. It works super well for smaller patients or really hypotensive patients. Um, it's what we use if we can't place an art line in something that is a serious case. We're going to rely on our Doppler. It's, um, the upsides to this, it's still less invasive than direct, so you can use it in awake patients as well as anesthetized. Um, it is more accurate because you can use it in all sizes. The downside to a Doppler is that Sometimes if you're in surgery and you have a bear hugger blowing and the music going in the background or a surgeon trying to talk to you and kind of 
If they need more things than what they have on the table, you're trying to listen to that, trying to dive under the patient drapes to get this Doppler. It can be a little bit difficult at times. Um, also, in severe hypertension and severe hypotension, um, it might be a little bit harder to get these results. So your arterial direct blood pressure. This is really, it is the gold standard, what she was saying. So you place a catheter in a peripheral artery, artery connected to a bag of fluids. We typically use heparinized saline here. Um, it converts mechanical fluctuations in the fluids to electronic signals. Upsides. It is the gold standard. It is the best way um, to measure blood pressure that they've found. So it's the most accurate, it's constant, so you can really measure the trends. That's what you're looking for under anesthesia is the trends. Nothing, um, unless they are ligating something in surgery that's major or um, something along those lines, you're not going to see this patient was normal two seconds ago and all of a sudden it's the most hypotensive, don't know if it's going to make it off the table. Um, usually it's, it's trending a certain way. The Downside is, one, it's messy. It's super messy. Anytime you put in a art line, there will be a mess on the floor. Usually, that's, it means it's in, so that's how we know it. Um, the, another downside is it's essentially a catheter. So you're going to have the same things that you can have with a catheter. You're going to have um, possible infection at the site, hemorrhaging if the art line comes and wiggles out of the artery. Um, typically, in surgery, if our patients are normal blood pressures towards the end of surgery or we keep it in for maybe an hour or two and we try to pull it as soon as possible just because that's not something that you want to mess with an infection over an artery. The cardiac output and times the systemic vascular resistance is the map. That's the most important thing for us when we're using anesthetics of any type. What is cardiac output? It's the output of blood from the heart per beat. Stroke volume is the blood pumped from the left ventricle per beat. And the systemic resistance is the resistance of blood flow offered by systemic vasculature. It's important because cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance is MAP. Getting off of the definitions and everything like that of the basics of blood pressure, um, anesthesia. So. It's a, a successful anesthesia when you're running cases and things like that. You know it's successful um, because it is when the patient runs through the case and you don't have a ton of hiccups throughout it or they can go through and you feel good because they haven't felt a lot of pain stimuli through the surgery. They're not going up and down getting light. Um, cats are harder to do than dogs but um, it's really successful anesthesia. It's recognized as the reversible controlled drug-induced intoxication of the central nervous system in which the patient neither perceives nor recalls noxious or painful stimuli. So really it's just a nice smooth case is what you're aiming for. Um, doesn't always happen, but it's what we're going for. Because our goal is to provide essentially like a, a pain-free state where the animal <clears throat> like is out enough to where you can do the necessary procedure. So the doctor can do what they need to or the wound can be debrided if it comes in um, without the animal feeling it. This is done by using multiple types of anesthesia. So anesthetics, when I'm saying anesthetics, I'm not talking about putting the dog under full anesthesia. I'm talking about, you know, you're using pre-meds, you're using sedation, you're doing local blocks, we do a lot of epidurals, um, muscle relaxants, and all of that is used in sync to get to that state. How does this tie into hypotension? Um, th with the mean arterial pressure that we talked about earlier, if it's less than 60, that's when, for extended periods of time, it can produce compromised perfusion. So this means that the organs are essentially not getting all the blood flow that they need, and when they wake up, it could be you know, overall body function could be decreased as well as organ failure can, can occur from that. This really ties into it because anesthetics provide a primary cause. So blood pressure monitoring can provide a really important insight into the anesthetic depth as well as the overall body function. Um, potential causes. The number, <laughs> the number one thing, it's kind of funny to me, but um, anesthetics are a necessary evil, so they are something that we need to get the patient under. We need to have this cat sedated so that we can take out something that's stuck in its leg. We need this dog to have this surgery so that I can live. 
but anesthetics are number one on the list for causing hypotension. Um, excessive depth is something that we can you know, monitor with anesthesia, but it's something that we see. Um, hypovolemia due to intraoperative bleeding, dehydration, hypothermia, underlying diseases, and heart rate. So the first thing, um, anesthetics lower systemic vascular resistance. Um, ultimately, that leads to hypotension, which is just the lower MAP. Um, all of the drugs on here are things that are used every day at practices, and all of them can lead to hypotension. So your opioids, they cause depression of heart rate and respirations. So they are needed though, as they're a necessity for decreasing the bigger problem, um, which is MAC. We want to ultimately lower the amount of inhalant. So if we want to do that, we need good pre-meds on board. We need them to have a good CRI. Um, all of these drugs are used in combination um, with each other and others to kind of get to that goal of anesthesia, which is that state where we can essentially do what we need to without causing too much damage. The benzodiazepines, um, your midaz and diazepam, they are minimal cardiovascular depression, um, but they do have a dose-related respiratory depression. Tranquilizers, ace, promazine, we don't use it too, too much in surgery, but I know that a lot of places use it because it is necessary, um, but hypotension and hypothermia are very common because it vasodilates the vessels. Your alpha-2s, these are also used pretty commonly. We use them on surgery patients that come in that we can't really touch without them getting upset. Um, so these provide dose-dependent bradycardia, um, some arrhythmias, respiratory depression, peripheral vasoconstriction at times, and they overall decrease cardiac output. Induction agents. So these are also, without them, it's kind of almost impossible to knock out anything. So the induction agents do cause significant respiratory depression. They do myocardial depression and vasodilation, as well as increased circulation time, apnea, and cyanosis. Your inhalants are dose-dependent cardiovascular depression, as well as respiratory depression and extreme vasodilation. So all of these things, I've just told you a bunch of scary things that they do to the patient, and we use them every day. It's a necessity. But I just wanted everyone to know these things have these effects, and that's why we need them, but we need to monitor. I just wanted to stress through these causes why, why we monitor blood pressure so carefully, especially in an anesthetized patient. Okay, so excessive depth is the second thing on the list. Um, it really is what can provide that state where the body can't really respond. So in 1846, uh, Dr. Wendell described anesthesia as without feeling and analgesia as without pain. Um, as anesthesia inhalants and drug, drugs still cause both of these, I think he kind of hit it on the head in 1846 when he decided that. That's overall what we're going for. Um, it relates with our overall goal of anesthesia. So hypovolemia, it's a decrease of the volume of fluid in the vascular system. I'm sure that every one of us has seen blood-soaked gauzes um, and maybe like a, a full suction bucket. Um, these things need to be taken into consideration. It's, yes, it's more than just a bloody soaked gauze. There is amount of blood in that that needs to be replaced. That's typically why when they're under anesthesia we put them on fluids is to constantly be giving this replacement fluid um, because not having enough fluid in the body system causes decreased cardiac output and stroke volume which leads to a decrease in MAP which leads to decreased tissue perfusion which is hypotension. Hypothermia is a, a big one that people forget um, because the blood pressure drops and you're trying to worry about giving, making sure they have enough fluids, you're trying to make sure their heart rate's great, everything's perfect on the monitor, um, and then you look down at a little tiny bitty temperature gauge thing at the very bottom of the screen, um, at least that's where it is on ours, and it says 96.3, and you're like, oh, well, that could be why. Our heart rate is lower, our blood pressure is lower. Um, in an awake patient, normally they have vasoconstriction. They are able to shunt blood to vital organs, and they can shiver to warm themselves up. In an anesthetized patient, they kind of have the opposite. They have vasodilation going on, and they can reset the thermoregulation center in their brain to where 96.3 doesn't seem so bad. 
on top of all these things, when we're doing surgery, um, or if you're doing a clip and clean on a patient that comes in, you're just adding more hypothermia chances. So you're clipping hair, you're laying patient on a gurney, you're taking x-rays um, with a patient on a colder table, um, you're you know, really messing with all the drugs. As soon as you give that pre-med, it's a chance for hypothermia to set in because the animal kind of loses that compensation response that they have, which is what leads to them shivering. So they aren't able to shiver anymore. Underlying disease, so we have the septic patient, kidney disease, liver disease, um, patients that are coming in for different things that you didn't know that they had these diseases until they're un under anesthesia and it's not fun anymore. So um, the, the pictures that I put up here, yes, we have the sick patients, um, the septic patients and the ones that aren't feeling well, but we also have geriatric patients, we have neonates, we have pediatric patients that are coming in and they all have compromised organs and systems so they're not really an underlying disease but it's just something that they have that you have to kind of take into consideration. They're not going to be the ideal surgical candidates. Um, they do require more attention because they're not going to process all of your anesthetics as easily as everything else a healthy happy two-year-old lab might do. These things, you have to be really on top of it because they're going to battle with things such as hypothermia and dehydration more readily than, than any other patients. Um, these guys are going to be possibly hypotensive when they step through the door. The owner might bring them to you and hand them to you. And, um, it's a little tiny baby kitten and there's not any warming around it. And you poke it with a thermometer and it's going to be low. And it's just, you're already kind of fighting that battle because you know that you have to put it under anesthesia, but you're already cold. And that's just something that you have to face, but you have to know that and move forward with it. Heart rate I put at the end because it's kind of a, it's a plus or minus. Um, it's not always going to affect your map, but it does at times. So pediatrics are especially highly dependent on heart rate because that's what's going to depend on their cardiac output and blood pressure. So they may have a decreased systemic system development, um, which means they just can't tolerate things such as hypothermia and blood loss as readily as others. Um, they have a harder time maintaining blood pressure. Geriatrics have organ dysfunction possibilities um, due to underlying issues and they don't really have compensation for cardiac changes that may occur with anesthesia. So you're gonna, your pre-med that you give um, might lower their heart rate just a little bit too much where that's hard for them, so then they drop pressures because of it. So all these things are just, they're monitoring devices that we really have the ability to do when we're under anesthesia. It's something that we should keep up with all of these things because in combination, all of these things will lead you to a correct diagnosis of hypotension. So before we freak out and think that our patient is severely hypotensive, um, I've put a list of troubleshooting things that are simple fixes that we should rule out before we go giving fluid boluses and inotropes. Um, cuff size, I know that she mentioned that. Location of it. Consistency. Um, that's why we always make sure when we're on ICU sheets or treatment sheets, we make sure we jot down what cuff size, what leg we use, because if you use a different leg, it could give you a different result. Um, clots in arterial lines, we deal with it all the time. Smaller catheters, just like in regular um, um, vein catheters, they're going to give you clots. So you can flush it or you, you can pull out and dislodge the, cot, the clot. Um, picking the right monitoring device is a big one and pulse quality is something that gets forgotten about so if you get a Doppler of let's say 40 for systolic and it's freaking you out you stick your hand and you can feel their femoral pulse and maybe it's not so scary because if, if it were 40 you wouldn't be able to feel good strong pulses that way so then you can go back and recheck but you have a little bit of comfort in knowing that it's not that low. Treatments. Something as simple as proper ET selection. Your tube, the length, decreasing dead space is a good idea. Um, if we see this all the time, our patients sometimes will put the tube in too deep so it goes all to one side of your lungs, which means that your patient is going to get light. He's going to want to wake up, which means you're going to do what? Give more anesthetic, you're going to turn up your inhalant, you're going to maybe redose um, your pre-meds, you're going to possibly up your FL because you're thinking that it's due to something else. Once It could be so simple as backing out your trach tube.
or your AT tube, sorry. Proper monitoring. So you want to trust your monitors, but not too much. Your hands on the patient is going to tell you more. Excessive depth to look for that, eye position, jaw tone. Um, dehydration, so while you're in surgery or before surgery, when you're intubating, are the mucous membranes tacky? Do they look nice and pink or are, are we having some issues there? Pre-meds, so if you are getting, we get our patients, a lot of them over, well probably about half of our surgical patients come from our ER department. So what have they gotten before? If they're coming to your clinic and they've been to somewhere else, did they get something else before that you're possibly redosing as another pre-med? Or have they had fluid boluses and you're worried about overhydrating them? Something that's on our monitor that we come up with is heart rate versus pulse rate of things. So you want to really check your patient, get your hands on your patient, because sometimes the ECG will count a P wave as an entire complex and then you're getting double counts of heart rate when really you know, your heart rate's much lower than you think. Pay attention to the values and trends. So like I was saying earlier, you're not going to get, unless they're ligating something or doing something where you would have talked with the surgeon beforehand, you're not going to get a significant d decrease to where the patient is like on death's door um, right away. It's usually, you know, their blood pressure is at 80 and it's looking great and then all of a sudden it's in the 70s and then it's in the 60s and it just keeps kind of going down. Um, so you really need to pay attention to the trends so that you can fix it before it gets too low. Tissue perfusion. Your mucous membranes, your CRT, your pulse quality is a good one to look for. Um, Temperature, heating the patient. So we have plenty of options here and at any other clinic that I've been to, they've had plenty, but bear huggers, heating mats, um, having a towel down in x-ray can actually make a lot more difference than you think it can um, if you're going to be in there for a while. Wrapping extremities, we have little baby socks that we put on some of our animals and it makes a huge difference. Warming the fluid lines, so even if you don't have like fluid warmers that automatically do that for you, if you heat up a warming bag and then wrap your fluid lines around it, they're getting warm warm fluids instead of, you know, the room temperature or possibly colder. The pre-meds um, or the fluids needed before. So do they come in for what kind of surgery? Do you need to put them on maintenance? So our maintenance rate is described as the amount of fluid and electrolytes needed on a daily basis to keep the volume of water and electrolyte content normal in a well hydrated patient. This goes anywhere from 40 to 60 mils per kg per hour. We go the safe way here, we use 50 here. Uh, multiply it by the weight, divide it by 24, there you go, there's your hourly rate. Um, you can do this as a CRI. We do it post-op with all of our pain CRIs here. Um, but if they need fluids beforehand, it's not a bad idea to get them started. That way you're not battling it so hard when you're in surgery. The most important question in surgery is the inhalants. When I went over the anesthetic causes of hypotension, that's the main one. Um, can you decrease your ISO? Is there any way that you can maybe up your pain CRI um, and decrease those, that isoflurane or the sevaflurane? Crystalloids and colloids. What's the main difference between these? So your crystalloids, they're smaller molecules and they, extend, they expand the entire blood volume. So you're going to need more of them, which is not always ideal. The safest way to do it, it's something different than colloids because colloids do stay a little bit longer, which we'll go over. If you increase your blood volume, it allows for a better cardiac output, which is going to increase your MAP. So we say anywhere from 5 to 10 mils per kg, um, and we do two boluses, and then we're going to consult with our doctor. We could potentially do a third, depending on how dehydrated the patient is. Um, but when they're on a CRI, we do anywhere from two, two and a half to 10. So if they're already on fluids, you don't want to give too many boluses. Um, examples of these, they can be the sodium chloride. You can have plasmalite, Normar, um, LRS is another big one. Your colloids are they increase the intravascular compartment by their bigger molecules, they stay there longer. You need less of them, which means you have to be careful with your boluses and your CRI rate is a little bit lower for these. Um, but they require less total volume and um, then crystalloids. The bolus that we use is two and a half to five mils per kg. Um, we do one to two boluses depending on the patient and then if the blood pressure responds, we could potentially put them on a CRI. Um, so this is something that we have to take into account. If they're already on a crystalloid rate, you don't want to put them on their normal rate and then put them on a colloid rate. You definitely have to compensate for that and kind of take that into account. 
your reversals. Um, most people don't like to do these. We try not to, but you can do a partial or full reversal of your pre-med that you used. Or if they're on fentanyl lidocaine, um, we've done it before where we're taking them off of it because their blood pressure is crazy low and we want them to make it off of the table. Inotropes. So they enhance myocardial contractility of the heart by increasing cardiac output. Um, ideally, they are increasing the amount of blood ejected by the heart per beat. Or the three main ones we use in the clinic are dobutamine, dopamine, and norepi. Dopamine is a positive inotrope. It's going to increase blood pressure and heart rate. So it's really good for bradycardic and hypotensive patients. It's going to increase both blood pressure and heart rate. Dopamine is much more effective at increasing blood pressure than dobutamine. Um, we, I put this up here so that you guys can have it. When we are in surgery and we have 10 million things going on, um, the surgeon might be asking for a couple different things and you're trying to monitor a couple different things and um, putting them on CRIs, it's the easiest to have a simple go-to thing. So we use a 100 mil bag of sodium chloride and we have a set rate to where we can run it at one mil per keg per hour. It's very simple for us. Um, the range is 5 to 20 mics per keg per minute. In cats, it's a little bit lower as 1 to 5. It ca can cause seizures at higher doses. It's going to do modest vasoconstriction, but it's going to really um, increase your systemic vascular resistance as well. The dobutamine is the, um, another positive inotrope. It's really good for patients that have heart issues going into surgery um, because it's not really going to mess with your heart very much. It's mostly going to do the contractility or the um, strength of the pump that you're going to do per heartbeat. So it increases blood pressure, not so much heart rate. The range is 5 to 20 mics per keg per minute, so it's going to do modest vasodilation, but it's really going to increase the forward flow of the beats. Norepi is one that we've actually been using a lot more in our clinic. It constricts, it's a vasoconstrictor, constriction, sorry, it increases blood pressure, heart rate, and vasomotor tone and contractility. Another big one that we use here, we try to simplify it, so we're going to calculate it out at one mic per keg per minute. We're going to pull it up and find out whatever that is, dilute it with sodium chloride in a one, into one mil and run it on a syringe pump. It's just a little bit easier for us that way. If there isn't an improvement after about 10 minutes, you can increase it and double it. Um, ultimately, the max out dose is two mics per keg per minute, um, but if you use it at this high rate for an extended amount of time, it can cause tissue perfusion issues postoperatively. So really we try to, our clinic we, or our hospital, we max out at 0.5 mics per keg per minute. Vasopressin is one that I don't have a ton of experience with. We try not to use it because it is hundreds of dollars per vial. Um, so you definitely want to check with your surgeon or with the doctor before using it. We really use this when they're not responding to the other inotropes because va this vasopressor has a different way of reacting and has different receptors that it's going to act on. So in small animals under 15 kgs, if, you, if they don't respond to it, um, usually we're bumping it up after five minutes, so we're going to double it. In larger animals, you have a little bit more wiggle room. If it, they don't respond after five minutes, you can increase the rate at two mils per kg every five minutes. And the range for this is 0.5 to 5 mil units per kg per minute. Okay, so what if we do all those things that I just talked about, the bunch of slides that I just did, and your patient is still severely hypotensive. The most important thing is, gonna, is your patient safety. So that's, you should be communicating throughout the whole thing with your doctor or with the surgeon, but you might have to discontinue the surgery. So we've had plenty where we are planning to do multiple sites of surgery. Um, the patient is too hypotensive, so after the first one we stop. Or we've gotten in there, the patient becomes severely hypotensive and we don't feel comfortable moving forward. So we pretty much Hurry, hurry with it, finish what we can, um, and then try to get out of there in a timely fashion because you want them off of anesthesia. I have actually, I mean, we've done it tons of times where we're just strictly running off of the pain CRI and our epidural and our pre-meds. We turn the ISO completely off in some of our surgeries, at least while they're closing. That way you can get some of that inhalant off of your patient. I have a couple case studies that we did. Um, they're just ones that stuck out to me that I dealt with it was like a 
when they got out of the OR, you were like the breath of relief. Um, Cooper was one of my favorites. He was a five-year-old male neutered lab retriever. He came in for a gunshot wound to our ER. Um, we ran blood work, we did boluses, we did x-rays, um, we saw an, an entry wound through the diaphragm. So our plan, he was stable enough for surgery, we were going in right away. So we got in there and these are the things that I used um, preoperatively. So I just kind of used the lowest amount of what I could. Um, through surgery, his blood pressure initially was in the low 70s for a systolic. Um, I ended up decreasing my ISO from 1% to a quarter. I gave three crystalloid boluses in surgery. I gave one vet starch bolus, and then as we were closing, I turned off ISO completely. Post-operative blood pressures ended up being 86, 82, and 86, so they were in the mid 80s. We knew we had some ground to cover, so he stayed in our ICU on heavy antibiotics and fluids. He stayed 14 days in the hospital, and he looks amazing. He is one of our favorite patients. He comes through, and everybody has to say hi to him because he was such a big ordeal. Franklin is another big one for us. Um, our hospital definitely fought for him. Um, when he first came in, he looked like if the owner hadn't found him and gotten the other dog off of him, I don't think he would have made it. I'm kind of surprised that he made it, but um, we had to stabilize him for a couple days before we went to surgery. He came in on the 28th of November for that dog attack. He was ripped to shreds. We initially were trying to do wound debridement, so they sedated him. Um, we couldn't find a blood pressure on him. So they gave a bolus and it was 90 and then it all of a sudden went away and we couldn't really, you know, it started going down. We couldn't find it anymore. So we had to do plenty days of stabilization um, in our ER, antibiotics, pain. He got two blood transfusions. He was on a norepi CRI before we got him. So when we got him, um, he ran on really low ISO and I gave... He, I mean, a fentanyl bolus, something that would be quick to reverse if I needed it to. Um, he got a low dose of midazolam. His epidural was, um, it worked pretty well through surgery, so we were able to run him on a little bit lower ISO. Um, he did get two crystalloid boluses in surgery, and we kept him at that 0.5 mics per kg per minute, um, nor epi CRI. And it eventually came up into the high 90s. Um, it was kind of touch and go through his entire surgery. Um, Post-op, his blood pressures, uh, I mean, after an hour, were 116 and 120. So um, he stayed 13 days total, and he came back a couple times for minor wound care on the other body parts that were torn to shreds, um, and he is doing great as well. He comes through um, just for the owner did, we ended up amputating one of the legs, so the owner came back for our um, physical therapy and he would also strut through the hospital on his three legs. <laughs> Cricket is the last one that I'm going to bring up. So Cricket was a two-year-old female spade Yorkie. That was 2.4 kgs. Presented on the 22nd for a portosystemic shunt. This dog was symptomatic. She was having seizures. Her blood work was um, kind of all over the place. She had anemia. Um, we did an ultrasound on her beforehand so we knew what we were getting ourselves into. Um, she did have normal clotting factors and we planned to go in there, excuse the typo, but we planned to go in there and do surgical placement of a cellophane band to close the shunt. So in surgery, we used, because it was a liver compromised patient, um, methadone, preservative free pro propofol, preservative th free morphine for an epidural. Um, an art line was attempted to no avail because she was 2.4 kgs and it was a little bit challenging. Um, so we utilized our Doppler in surgery. Um, we got into surgery and she had a mid-40 systolic. So we decreased our fentanyl CRI, or we, sorry, we increased our fentanyl CRI so that we could decrease the ISO. Um, her temp was initially 97.2. Uh, when we got into the OR, it dropped all the way down to 95.4. Um, and it was 96.2 by the time we left the OR, and that was with two warmies, a bear hugger, um, the warming fluid around the IV line. It was really fun. Um, we also had a dopamine CRI going that we initially started at the lowest rate and then it, we had to bump it up and double it. Um, when we left surgery, 
It was up in the 80s. So this was one um, that unfortunately did not make it. She was severely hypotensive coming into surgery and we knew this and she transferred. We have um, one of, we had our ER staff working so hard on her for two days straight to kind of get that up. Unfortunately, the hypotension never resolved. Um, she was on dopamine, she was on vasopressin, she was on norepi, she was on fluids. Um, we all, I mean, these were, it was really complicated because she was only 2.4 kgs and really how much fluids can you give a dog that size? But um, she, after all the fighting, the owners decided to euthanize because she wasn't, she wasn't coming out of it. So with all these things, um, what is the most important thing? That's patient safety and patient care. Um, you want to give things some time. So that was one of the most useful things that we had an anesthesiologist come to us and talk to us, and that was one of the most useful things that she said was you, you can't give a drug and expect it to work within a second because then you're going to get antsy, you're going to get impatient, you're going to give the patient some more drugs and then it's going to all hit at once and you're going to have the other problem um, going on. So you really want to make sure also that they're warm. I mean you're going to give all these drugs while they are hypothermic and then they become normalized in temperature and you're going to see all the other things. And really know your patient, know who you're anesthetizing, know the problems, know the, you know, the signalman of all of them, um, because we are really supposed to be tailoring all of our protocols to each patient. The truth is that anesthetics, they're a necessary evil with all of our patients with hypotension, um, and it's going to happen. So if you have an understanding of the possible causes as well as you know, an importance of how much you're monitoring and how important it is to monitor and you can have some knowledge of treatments along with talking with a doctor, um, it can become a little bit less scary. So I just have this kind of up there because um, I came into anesthesia two years ago and I feel like I've absorbed a lot of information. I know that I have a lot more to go but without my team I don't think I'd be able to. And then I just like these, so I just wanted to put them up there. But it, does anyone have any questions or anything that they need to say? I mean, anyone have any different experiences with these drugs or anything like that? I guess with your ISO versus your injectables, thinking that you could back off your ISO easier instead of waiting for your injectables to wear off unless you had a reversal, it's always thought a different direction on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we definitely um, have, we've started since we've gotten more, um, we have our criticalist coming in and working with us more and our ER doctors to kind of up, up our knowledge about that. We used to just really mainly rely on the ISO and just backing that down, but there are some cases you try to back it down and you can't, um, so you have to go right back up and then you're kind of where you started. So I think we've definitely been trying to do more reversals, especially post-operatively coming out. Anything else? Any other questions, comments, stories? Everybody's just happy to be done.